Crossroad of Religion and Life, produced by the Austin Metropolitan Ministries in cooperation with KTBC-TV. Austin Faith Dialogue highlights the interaction of the religious community with the social and cultural issues throughout our area. Now, today's edition of Austin Faith Dialogue. Hello, and welcome once again to the Austin Faith Dialogue. I'm John McCarthy, the Roman Catholic Bishop of the Diocese of Austin, and I have the very real pleasure of being able to visit today with two of my friends, Helen Alvare of Washington, D.C., who's a spokesperson for the National Conference of Catholic Bishops in the area of pro-life concerns, and Teresa Ware, longtime Austinite, who's the director and really the founder of a very wonderful organization to help uh, women who are faced with difficult situations in their lives called Lifeline. Welcome to Austin, Helen. Thank you very much. Helen, uh, there are a lot of things that we could talk about, but uh, I know a lot about your work, and it's in an area where there's a great deal of confusion and conflict in this country. The whole issue of abortion, uh, the right to life, uh, others argue in terms of choice, it's, it has uh, rendered uh, the unity of this country, at least in that area. I know also that you're a person who's spent a lot of time moving around the country uh, trying to add a dimension to this debate that's sometimes lost, namely rationality. Uh, I'm happy to have Teresa here because, Teresa, you represent, in my opinion, a concern of the religious community that uh, uh, the tension that we bring into the lives of uh, uh, young women with, in quotation marks, problem pregnancies is not a necessary thing and that s serious citizens. And, and religious people can provide the kind of help that they really need. Uh, Helen, I'd like to ask you first to, if you would uh, describe for, for the, our viewers how you see the abortion uh, issue, the debate that's going on. How, how would you frame it from your perspective and the perspective of the American Catholic bishops? Well, as I travel around the country, what I see is most people beginning their reflections on abortion by acknowledging that every abortion is a tragedy. Mm -hmm. The polls that have been taken on this have rendered people more confused than anything. Mm -hmm. But essentially, if you synthesize them, what you find is most people, a small majority, take the label of pro-choice. But even among those people, and add to that the rest of the country, there is a a willingness to tolerate legally abortion for what they call the hard cases, mm -hmm. uh, rape, incest, and life of the mm -hmm. mother, and an unwillingness to legally tolerate it in other cases. Mm -hmm. You have a tremendous consensus among Americans, um, and among American women in particular, about things like women receiving full informed consent, mm -hmm. you know, just basic health protection for mm -hmm. a woman, about parents being involved with their children's decisions, about women being given time to reflect on abortion. You also have a national consensus that what we need is a way to approach the problems that are leading women to the clinics in the first mm -hmm. place. One of the reasons that I'm so proud to, to speak with and for the church on this is because I think that we try very, very hard to investigate and to solve the various economic problems, problems of discrimination against women, et cetera, that are leading women to feel that they, they must choose abortion or all these other things will be denied to them. Um, really the very real fact of discrimination against women in a great variety of areas in the country, sure. and it's just empirically true on paper even, is what's leading them there. And most people have a consensus on that too. Well, what you're working towards, expanding that consensus and deepening it uh, nationally is something that Teresa is working at very hard right here locally. And Teresa, I think for at least 15 or 16 years, have you not? Yes, this December is the end of our 15th year. Uh, Tell our viewers in, in outline form what you and your co your co-workers do in terms of Lifeline. Well, we provide social services, in-depth social services for women who are pregnant and their families because we feel that a pregnant woman cannot be isolated from her family mm -hmm. and it is the, the family dynamics that often uh, lead her to wonder what she's going to do about this pregnancy. And so we are very we are very careful not to see the pregnancy in isolation, and it is it is part of the family, and that's what we try and do. Um, I was interested to hear um, Helen say about the why women choose abortion, and in the 15 years that we have been going, uh, 
the vast majority of the women we see do not want to have an abortion. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the, what we see is that sometimes the poorer and the less educated are the ones that want to keep their babies, and the more educated and the more affluent want to have the abortion. And I think it's because they cannot come to grips with <coughs> what they think is they might have to give up is what you That's said, right. yes. I couldn't agree with that more. In fact, when you look at statistics on the mm -hmm. subject, the poorer a woman is, mm -hmm. the less education she has, um, the more she opposes abortion. That's correct. There is a, there's not the same necessity to choose between uh, perhaps a lucrative career mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the child. Unfortunately, the way that our institutions and our society are set up, whether it's employment, whether it is education, mm -hmm whether it's all kinds of medical health care systems, etc., the woman is all, almost given an incentive to remain child-free. Mm -hmm. To me, that's what I think is one of the greatest failures of some forms of feminism. I consider mm -hmm. myself a pro-life feminist. The feminism that supports legal abortion has invested so much of its time in retaining the legality of abortion that I think it has missed mm -hmm. changing the social structures that cause a woman to feel that she can come into society equally if she doesn't come in with any children. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, a growing consensus and some nuances, uh, people beginning to see certain ramifications on this issue that may be uh, those uh, views that weren't dominant 10 or 15 years ago. I'm sure that's to a great extent uh, due to First of all, the fact that we've been forced to face the issue of abortion uh, more clearly uh, than, than I think we, were, we tended to do. Uh, I'm, when I say we, I mean the, the totality of the American people, uh, not me. Uh, a great deal of that is due to educational efforts, certainly in the Roman Catholic Church, and I'm th happy and thrilled to say and uh, what used to be framed in the in media as a, as a Catholic issue has now seen as a, an issue in which the majority of American people, in terms of the substantial factor present, are in agreement right. that life is sacred, that an individual needs to be protected. Uh, tell me, Helen, as you move around the country, how do you carry out your task? You've got multiple audiences. I would, uh, when you, you, you're dealing uh, frequently with Roman Catholics, but you're also dealing with the larger community as well. How do you make the pro-life position from your perspective? Mm -hmm. I probably get about an equal number of Catholics <coughs> and an equal number of non-Catholics, persons with religion or, or no religious background, mm -hmm. coming to the various talks that I give. Particularly, this is true on college campuses. Mm -hmm. Students are not coming to this because of a religious interest. They're coming to it because it is a question of such great social upheaval and they want to find a vision of an answer. Um, I usually begin my speeches by articulating the situation in our country vis-a-vis -vis abortion and the national feeling that this has got to be stopped, it, that these are too many abortions, no matter what label a person takes for themselves. I then articulate the rational bases of a position. In fact, a lot of people believe that the Catholic Church has been speaking on this out of some esoteric theological notion that only Catholics could begin to understand. And I point out to them that we <coughs> begin where anybody would begin from a humanitarian basis, which is medical science indicates to us that there is human life present in the womb. Sometimes you have to get very basic and say, this is not a tree, this is not a flower, mm -hmm. this, this is human. Mm -hmm. And it is our job first as human beings to give respect to that person. That is something, that is a notion that is rationally available to anybody, no matter mm -hmm. religious or non-religious background. I often draw analogies between the unborn child as powerless and the powerlessness of, of women in society who were denied the vote and who were denied the right to own property, between the powerlessness of everyone... Job opportunities and pay. And still to today, mm -hmm. I draw analogies between all sorts of powerless classes. Mm -hmm. And I ask whether or not, <coughs> as human beings in the first place, and as Americans in particular, who have prided ourselves on our care for the vulnerable and the outsider, we want to adopt a policy whose bottom line is because of the powerlessness of the child, we can take advantage of that to gain other ends. Let me respectfully disagree with you. <clears throat> we don't have too good a history 
of being concerned about the vulnerable in our country, whether it be the American Indians, whether it be uh, uh, blacks first in slavery and then in a form of economic servitude. Uh, the only time the vulnerable in our society really get the protection that they have a natural right to and a constitutional right to is either with they themselves or others come forward to help them to stress to the American mm -hmm. conscience that we're not living in terms of the values that brought this country into existence. That's why I think your work is so important, and, I, and, and yours as well, that you're really, in, from my perspective, two sides of a coin, a wonderful educational effort going around the nation talking about what the real issues are, stripping away the rhetoric and the, and the bitterness and the anger. <clears throat> and at the same time showing the type of concern that we have to, to Teresa told us some of the things that she's doing here in Austin uh, you must see many programs like that around the country oh uh, I do I really do in fact uh, I've seen some exemplary programs they they have the same philosophy as what Teresa has described and I think the reason is because that philosophy works mm -hmm. it's a healing philosophy for the women the children and the families <coughs> I've seen some programs whether it's in Kansas or whether it's in California uh, one in Kansas in particular strikes me um, it's called hope net it's an ecumenical effort mm -hmm. um, members of 13 different faith congregations coming together after the protest that occurred in Wichita and saying you know we want to approach this from uh, a pastoral outreach approach and what they've done is a woman comes in and the father of the child if he will come and they see if she is financially eligible for their services if she is she gets a gold card the age of credit cards she can take that little credit card that hope net credit card to services around town all variety of professional services and not just those interestingly related to actually prenatal or postnatal care but dentists if she needs it, clothing stores if she needs it, financial counseling if she needs it. Those professionals will provide the service on the promise that HopeNet will pay. They're encouraged to pay, f to charge only 50%. Mm -hmm. What HopeNet is finding is that these professionals aren't charging at all. And they're giving their services to these, to these women and, and, the, and the husbands or fathers. And, uh, so you're really drawing the whole community, exactly. the religious community, the professional communities exactly. in together to respond to the needs. Do you get that kind of cooperation in Austin, Teresa? Can you get it? That's a maybe a better question. Um, yes, we do get it a little bit, but <clears throat> I'd like to interject here something that really strikes me in this issue. Um, we have come to focus on abortion and the solutions as a woman's issue primarily because it's the woman that carries the child but I think we would have a totally different um, viewpoint of the whole thing if the fathers of these babies took responsibility for procreating children and they don't and the same power structure Teresa, I couldn't agree more uh, that's a tragedy in our society mm -hmm. with uh, comp uh, 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 I'm pausing for a second because I'm, I'm thinking of the abandoning of children that are born, uh, the, the, the massive lack of responsibility in a sizable segment of our male population. Uh, and I, I recognize the seriousness of it, uh, but um, we're just going to have to, you and I and, work, and everybody who's concerned about it, work on that. But it's, it is a major issue in this country. I'd like to concentrate, though, on... Uh, uh, Helen's not concentrate on it, but touch on it. She said something that sort of took me back for a second. You identified yourself as a Catholic feminist. That's right. Is that a contradiction? <laughs> I think it's a, it's a redundancy, frankly. Uh -huh. um, my feminism derives, it derives from logic mm -hmm. in many ways. It just is obvious to me in this world from looking around that women have gifts and should bear responsibilities mm -hmm. as men do. But it also derives very specifically from my Catholic faith. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the men uh, at Villanova, whom I <laughs> terrorized in my economics classes and by, by equalizing mm -hmm. the budgets between the men's and the women's groups, uh, would definitely accord Another me. Another step forward. That's right, that title of a Catholic feminist. To me, when you look at the way Jesus Christ behaved toward women, uh -huh. toward all outcasts, uh -huh. it is <laughs> obvious that Jesus intended for every segment of the human population, mm -hmm. and in particular those who suffered discrimination and oppression as women have, to take their rightful place. Helen, I'm going to ask you to expand on that, if I may, but we're going to take a brief break for just a moment. We'll be right back with you.
Serving Austin means serving you. Each day, Austin Metropolitan Ministries is religion in action, providing affordable housing, caring for the elderly, marching against hunger, and much more. AMM promotes understanding, cooperation, and social involvement. So when we ask for your help, we're really asking to help you, Austin. To find out how you can help Austin Metropolitan Ministries help Austin through its member organizations, just call 472-7627. Thank you very much. Welcome back. Uh, I was visiting with Teresa Ware, uh, here in Austin, director of Lifeline, and Helen Alvare, uh, Alvare is the correct pronunciation, <laughs> uh, visiting us from Washington, D.C. And Helen, we were talking about what to me is a fascinating thing. I, I think most people think of feminism so strongly identified with, uh, uh, in the public consciousness at least, uh, with uh, the issue of abortion. Uh, and when you say uh, uh, a feminist who's concerned for life and the sacredness of life, right. uh, that's not uh, clearly in everybody's mind. Would you mind yeah. expanding on that? Well, you know, there's a growing movement among women, particularly women my age, mm -hmm. who uh, we did benefit quite a bit from, you know, the, the reinvigorated feminist movement of the 60s and 70s, but they also freed up our minds to think for ourselves now, didn't they? And so yeah. we didn't buy all of the, um, the positions that were mm -hmm. being promoted uh, by groups, say, like National Organization of Women, a position that they take in favor of legal abortion. To me, the ideals of feminism, nonviolence, consensus, <coughs> attention to the vulnerable and the oppressed, are realized not by a position in favor of legal abortion, but the opposite, a position favoring the well-being of the mother and the child together. Abortion is a violence. It's just a fact. Even nobody Simone de Beauvoir, you just couldn't, <coughs> you know, decry yeah. that. You don't achieve the consensus of the people involved. There is one person who makes the decision. Uh, the state has pulled away. The father's not really permitted to be involved legally, as you were commenting on before. The parents are barely permitted to be involved. The woman is isolated with this decision. She makes it. There's no consensus with the child. Certainly, the, the feminist principle of attention to the vulnerable. Here we are, just so recently emerging from the class of the regularly oppressed ourselves, are we going to turn around and oppress another class as the means to achieve even good ends for mm -hmm. ourselves? Additionally, um, I think that by characterizing women's ability to bear children as a liability and not a gift, the pro-abortion feminist has given new life to the old sexist argument that women's ability to bear children is a burden and therefore she's somehow second class. I think we have to affirm that this ability is a gift, a gift that women bring in addition to society. And that's the true pro-woman position. When you speak on college campuses and you make that presentation, what kind of a response do you see in 22-year-olds? I have to tell you, I get a good response. And yeah. it even surprises me. Mm -hmm. It really does. I, the usual response I get from people who come to a talk disagreeing with me is, well, I don't quite agree with you, but that was a really good presentation. You've given me something to think about. Mm -hmm. And that's a gift <coughs> in itself. <laughs> to a committed uh, college uh, person. I don't know if you encounter women coming into to lifelines who, who have this feeling that their pregnancy is nothing but a burden and that everybody's treating it that way, and it makes them feel terrible about something that, that inwardly or naturally they might be inclined to be happy about. Yes, I think there's a very a severe conflict there because women are nurturing beings that that is inherent in our makeup and so there's this terrific conflict with what society is expecting her to perceive her pregnancy as and I and I agree with you there <coughs> but what I do find among women is the tremendous courage that they all have in in going against what society mm -hmm. is telling them to do, you know, to have an abortion, and they well, give really life to their child. Well, that's true of every person who comes to you, isn't it? Yes. That person is, yes. in a sense, in the culture that we live, swimming upstream. That's correct. Uh, mm -hmm. She has a baby. She wants to give it life. Other people are saying, you know, you can solve this so easily. And she comes to you. I think it's just so marvelous that you have a cadre of people with you. And, and as you said, Helen, dozens if not hundreds of organizations like this around the country. That's right. 
Helen, you uh, won't be in Austin very long. Uh, you've, you're watch, uh, a few thousand people are watching you this morning. Uh, what would you like to leave us with in terms of uh, an attitude, something as like those college kids, something to think about? Right. Well, I think the way that the abortion debate has been framed in America has been uh, framed with a moral ideal that is too narrow, that is too exclusive. That it is usually framed with the question, who decides, the mother alone or the state interfering? I think that that is not only a false way of presenting the question, <coughs> but unduly narrow and not humane enough. A broader, more inclusive, more caring way of framing the question that we have to face, I think, is why can't we love them both, mother and child? Why do we start from a presumption that only one comes out of this alive? That as a society, we're so stingy that we'll give resources to the mother or the child, but not both. So I think we have to ask ourselves, why can't we love them both? What has prevented us as an American people who, you're right, with a history that's very bumpy, but with an ideal that's the very ideal generous yes. from reaching out to both of them instead of pitting the mother against her child. Do you feel that uh, you're making headway as you, uh, it's a rhetorical question because you wouldn't be working this hard if you didn't have hope <laughs> and optimism for your cause. That's right. But uh, I would say that uh, the general attitude in the country sees the issue with far more complexity uh, and sees the subtleness of this and, and the beauty of what you just said. Why can't we love them both? I leave today remembering that, Helena. Thank you. I want to thank uh, both of you and, and uh, ask you to take an opportunity now uh, with a, to visit with our viewers and say, you represent in, in your person and in your commitment uh, increased knowledge and understanding of the whole issue. Uh, the potential to bring love where there is violence. And you represent that in a very concrete way right here in our own uh, neighborhood, Teresa. So I'd like to ask both of you, you first, Teresa, if, if there was a viewer who wanted to help you, what can they do, not just with Lifeline, but what can they do in the greater Austin area uh, to assist with this very, very painful situation that we've gotten ourselves into because of a lack of love? There are many opportunities for helping in this area. There's Lifeline and there's um, other, uh, another crisis pregnancy center. And there's also the ways in which they can be inv involved politically, several organizations that, that they can help in the political way. There are myriad ways that they can work with women directly or in support services. And in whatever they do is going to make things better. Uh -huh. Well, when you bring people in, uh, I'm talking to Helen in terms of education, but when you get uh, people involved in your programs, give me a little about the, what happens to them. I'm not talking about the young woman who's pregnant, but mm -hmm. the 35-year-old the woman who herself already has three children and, and wants to help this young girl. How, how does she react to that in terms of her own growth and understanding? I think that she comes away with a tremendous gift of uh, the knowledge of the powerfulness of a woman to uh, withstand pain and suffering and to overcome that mm -hmm. and, the, and the courage that she has. I think the courage of our clients is the one thing that really mm -hmm. um, amazes people mm -hmm. that come into the program. How mm -hmm. does she have the courage to continue going? And mm -hmm. it, it is sometimes that we feel with our love and support she's able to do that. Mm -hmm. Helen, I want to come back to you and ask you a question of, about uh, a national mood uh, 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 in dealing and helping women who have had an abortion. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you look at the statistics, uh, let's, if you accept the figure, two million abortions a year in this country, it may be considerably higher. There, it means that each year there are two million women out there who have lived through this violence. That's right. Uh, I, I'm pleased about the fact that <clears throat> many religious groups are not only doing what Teresa is in terms of trying to help 
with uh, the young woman with the pregnancy, but they're also growing more sensitive of the pain and the suffering that may be in that woman's life after an abortion. That's right. Do you know of any programs like that that are moving around? Uh, within <clears throat> the church's 180-some dioceses around the country, 80 of those dioceses have a Project Rachel. I don't think I can summarize it better uh, than by repeating something that Father Mike Mannion, who is one of the primary movers in Project Rachel, said. In his office, he has a poster of a young modern woman in the back of Jesus looking at this woman. And at the bottom, it says, nor do I condemn you, repeating a, a scriptural <coughs> quotation. Project Rachel is intended to open arms to any woman who has had an abortion. It doesn't, she doesn't have to be Catholic or re religious background at all to come and be healed, be healed within herself, be healed with her family. If she's a member of a church or religion, be healed with her church, her God. And it's, to me, it is the most tangible evidence that what the church has always said, that they always love the persons. Sure. It is the destructive <coughs> act that they oppose. It's the tangible evidence of, of the love that they really have for the persons involved. And they have helped <coughs> thousands and thousands of women. And I'm happy to say as I travel around the country, dioceses are picking up Project Rachel at a very, very fast rate. More and more are picking it up. As you see that happening, uh, d there's an overlap then between your educational work and the service work of the type that Teresa is in. If, if, if is there any way uh, that you could advise us in terms of your, we, Teresa's calls us to, to come forth with time and energy. What would you challenge the citizens of this area to do in terms of the issue of life? Right. Uh, you've been doing that for 25 minutes, but I just <laughs> want to give you an opportunity to synopsize that. First, to be educated about what's going on. Most Americans form their opinion about abortion singly or as a national phenomenon <clears throat> on complete misinformation mm -hmm. about how long it's legal, it is legal for nine months, about the situations of the women having them, what's driving them to it. It is our duty as citizens in the face of such a huge problem to be educated about what's really going on. It's <coughs> also our duty, say, through whatever community organizations work on this, to educate other people, mm -hmm. to contribute finances to organizations like Lifelines mm -hmm. and others. I mean, they really depend mm -hmm. on community support. Mm -hmm. It's also our duty to correct obvious mm -hmm. bias in media, to meet with local editorial boards, to introduce information to them that they may not have. Helen, you're giving us quite a task. Yes. But I know that there are a lot of our viewers who are uh, determined to work with you. And I want to thank you for watching us today. We're talking about an issue that's painful in our society, but very real, and the two guests offer us solutions, solutions based on love and generosity, uh, commitment to life. May God bless your work, and may Thank God you. bless the two of you. Thank you. For more information, call Austin Metropolitan Ministry.